Across the Atlantic, the United States is still coming to terms with the humiliation of being kicked out of the top tier of creditworthy nations. US growth is anemic, its confidence shattered, and its politics are, as Standard & Poor's bluntly put it, dysfunctional. For his take, I spoke to economist and strident critic of the Obama administration, Professor Peter Morisi from the University of Maryland's School of Business. Well, Professor Morisi, is this 2008 all over again? This is not 2008 all over again. It could be as, as bad, but it's not likely, simply because the problem is better defined and understood and the European Central Bank has the tools at its disposal. You know, it's very easy to say Greece is what was the next uh, Bear Stearns and uh, Italy will be the next Lehman Brothers and France could even be AIG. But in reality, this is a very different crisis and uh, the debt is concentrated on the books of the European banks and the European Central Bank can frankly just buy that debt up. In the United States, the 10-year bond yield has actually collaped since Sanded and Poor's reduced the credit rating a week ago. What's going on there? Well, the Standard & Poor's evaluates all countries by the same standards. So the United States was evaluated by the same metrics as Uruguay. Uh, in the past, we've had downgrades of Australia, Canada, Japan, and their bond rates didn't move either. Uh, the United States, just as those countries, is different from others. And uh, in the case of the United States, there's really no good alternative to U.S. securities. Uh, in Europe, the, the bonds are issued by the member states. There's no central European authority. And the largest issuer of European debt is Italy, of Eurobond debt is Italy. So, I mean, would you swap U.S. Treasuries for Italian bonds right now? You've pointed out that corporate America has a lot of cash, $1.1 trillion or so on their balance sheets, and this is locked up because of their uncertainty about the future. What do you think is required to unlock that money? Well, the United States is suffering from a lack of demand simply because it is a huge trade deficit, a situation that it doesn't share with Australia or Canada. As a consequence, the only thing that's really going to get the economy going again is doing something about that deficit, which means doing something about the exchange rate with China, which this administration is not inclined to do. I think that there's very little confidence in the business community in this administration's ability or inclination to do the right thing. Well, this week the Federal Reserve put out a pretty downbeat monetary policy statement in which it said it's locking in 0 to 0.25 percent interest rates for another two years. What do you make of that? The Federal Reserve is very pessimistic about the economic outlook for the United States. Uh, it sees uh, very slow growth, which is what I see. Uh, it doesn't necessarily see a recession, but certainly the risks have been enhanced. So it's locking in long rates uh, to try to assure people that it's there. Uh, and it may well take additional actions. We might see a QE3, which would drive the value of the dollar down perhaps uh, against uh, some currencies, the Australian dollar being one. Uh, but it will not have a salutary effect on the economy. The fact is the Federal Reserve is out of bullets. Uh, or I should say it's, it's got lots of bullets left, but they're rubber bullets. They're not really going to get the job done. And uh, fiscal policy has is, is gone the limit. A $1.6 trillion deficit, 10% of GDP, you can't be more stimulative than that. The third leg of macroeconomic policy, hardly ever used by large developed countries, is the exchange rate. And not that we should use it, it's that, that China has taken it away from us by arbitrarily pegging its currency. And this is causing a great disturbance in the United States, and the Obama administration has done a good job because it can't get China to change through diplomacy and hasn't got the courage or the stomach to do what's necessary, saying, well, it really doesn't matter because China has higher inflation. China's inflation is three percentage points above ours. China's currency is 40% undervalued, and its intrinsic value, owing to productivity improvements and modernization, goes up about 7% a year. So that argument just doesn't carry water. Well, what do you say they should do about the currency? Well, I think that if China won't revalue its currency, we ought to tax dollar yuan conversion, and that would simulate in its price effect on the United States, or on products in the United States, a revaluation. And we should set that tax equal to the value of Chinese currency market intervention, which is fairly transparent and traceable, divided by its exports. If its currency intervention goes away, the tax goes away. That's very provocative, I would point out. But free trade makes sense. If you get to do what you do better, and I get to do what I do better, and we maintain full employment. But the way trade works with China is they get to do what they do better, and they get to do what we do better. 
And that makes no sense at all. Uh, it can't be one way. Uh, and the whole Atlantic community, less Canada, is in trouble for it. Essentially, the resource exporters in the West, and I would include Australia in the West, so to speak, do well. Everybody else is doing lousy. And um, that's one of the reasons we have some of the budget problems we have. You know, U.S. budget issues certainly do need to be addressed with less spending. But they'd be a heck of a lot more manageable if we were growing at 4% a year like we should. And the same applies to those countries in southern Europe. Well, it sounds like you're suggesting that China is actually bankrupting the West. It is. Well, what's the outlook then? I mean, as you say, neither Washington nor Brussels has got much of a stomach to do something about it. The economic outlook is not very good. We have a president. He understands the problem about China. He has articulated it. But he doesn't have the courage to act. He never wants to do discomforting things. Even on the budget, he leaves it to the Congress. You know, the Republicans had a plan in Congress. The Democrats had a plan in Congress. The president offered a blank sheet of paper. He always wants someone else to deliver the bad news. He wants the Republicans to take the lead on budget cuts. He wants the Republicans to tell Americans that their retirement age has to be raised. Frankly, the man does not show the character of a leader. This is just no, uh, you know, this is just no Bill Clinton, to be sure. It's just not. Is another recession inevitable? I don't think it's inevitable. You know, this administration has done a lot of damage to the economy, but by electing a Republican Congress, it has essentially made it very difficult for the president to do much more damage. Uh, I don't think that we are going to, if I have to bet, I don't think we're going to go into a recession. But as I said, you know, it's sort of 50 50 plus that we won't go into a recession. You know, I'd hate to bet my house or my pension such as it is these days, uh, on us not going into a recession. The risks are there. Well, thanks very much for joining us, Peter Marisi. Take care.